Thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. Thank you, Peter, for solving uh, a lot of technical problems, except for one, which we can see now. Um, my lecture will be on basic, uh, basics of normal imaging, anatomy, and major variants. And these are the leftovers uh, from Peter, uh, which is the hollow viscera and the peritoneal cavity. Uh, I will not try to focus on everything with, 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 that can be wrong, but I will focus on a few things just for knowledge retention and to go into a little bit of depth. Um, I understand most of you are residents, so it will be quite basic. Um, let's not try to be this, eh? being you and being me, because this should be an interactive, nice session. Uh, you don't have to be afraid because uh, I will not point at people to give answers. Uh, my English is as bad as yours. Uh, I'm very benign. So when every answer is almost correct, uh, so feel at ease. Not like this, but like this. <laughs> so I have no disclosures except, uh, I must confess, I'm a pediatric radiologist. That means ultrasonography, conventional radiographs, a little bit of MRI, and very little CT. Well, let's rephrase. Very little CT of the abdomen. Um, let's rephrase again. No CT of the abdomen at all. I don't perform CT of the abdomen in children. It should not be done. It can be done all by ultrasonography in combination with conventional imaging and ultrasound, I think. Why? don't have to explain. This is a stillborn child. This is a CT. And I think I see bowel loops. I really don't know. And this is the MR. It's really striking what details you can see in this child. Dilated uh, urinary tract, dilated kidney, uh, adrenal gland, stomach. Well, you can see it all. You can't see the cells, but that's about it. So that's why I dislike CT in children, why they don't have any fat, they don't have any natural contrast medium. So I don't perform CT. So this is the only CT I guess you will see of a child. Uh, I like ultrasonography. Look at the resemblance of the ultrasound of the devastated renal parenchyma compared to this. This was a child with posterior urethral vals and uropathy, and it died from pulmonary hypoplasia. So let's start with prenatal imaging, because also prenatal children have normal anatomy, and it has specific features which I think might be very useful for you. Uh, we seldom, well, we always perform T1 weighted images in this fetus, and the mother is surrounding him yeah, now at this moment. Um, uh, but we, you should use CT, you should use T1 weighted images uh, for only, well, let's say four reasons. Because what is white on this image? You know, every answer is correct, I'm benign. <laughs> Th this is white. It's strikingly white, and otherwise you don't see anything on, on this T, T1 weighted image. Why? They don't have any fat. So obviously it's not fat. What might it be? What is white? Strikingly white on T1 in a fetus. What? No, it's not blood. It, it's meconium. Meconium is white. So that's one. Meconium is white. And this is normal because at this age, 20 weeks, the meconium should be in the colon and should be in the rectum. Otherwise, there is some passage problem. What else is white on a T1 weighted image? in children. Here it's in the rectum. That's good. No meconium ileus, no atresias. What else is white? Look at the neck region. Yes, thyroid. It's strikingly white on a T1 weighted image in a fetus. Also the liver is a little bit whitish and the spleen is almost black. And in most patients also the pituitary gland is white. So you have a few white items, <coughs> normal anatomy in prenatal children. But let's skip now prenatal imaging. Let's look at perinatal imaging. This is a newborn, as you can see. What's wrong? Because I don't think this is normal. 
and I guess I think you see it also. Just mention it. What, what strikes the eye? Yes, what's happening on the right side? What might be the problem in this child? It might be a huge liver. Well, in fact, it might be anything on the right side, compressing the bowel loops to the left. And if I mention that this is completely normal, what might be the explanation? Because we always have to consider age, even in ours. Why is this not a problem? 12 hours later, or six hours later even, now it's normal. These are normal bowel loops, but the air has not entered it yet. It has to go from the mouth through the anus, and that takes 24 hours. So this is actually, this is normal. Don't perform ultrasound, just wait and see. And the child was doing well, so why should you do ultrasound? And you have to take even hours into account in children. And this is normal plain abdominal radiograph anatomy. Oh, we have to go back because something else is very interesting. What's this? Easy question, easy answer. What is it? It's a line, where is it positioned? Through which vessel is it running? Yes, that's, that's a good answer. This is an umbilical vein. It seems as if, the, as if it is a femoral venous line going into the caval vein, into the right atrium, and a little bit too high in this case. Now, but this is way too lateral and way too thick for a child like this to be in the femoral vein. So it must be the umbilical vein. That's correct. Why do we use umbilical veins in children? Why do you think so? Yes. Yeah. And why do we use umbilical veins and not femoral veins? Because they are there. They are huge. They want to be catheterized. You see? Two arteries and a vein. And it's easy to put a big central line in, but it's dangerous. And that's why we have to discuss it. What's silly about this image? You can see two lines in place. What kind of lines are these? Arterial or venous umbilical lines? What do you think? This is normal anatomy. This is normal venous, normal arterial lines. They enter here. This is the umbilicus. Then they go down. Then they turn up. And then they eventually go into the aorta. What's important about these lines, the tips of these lines shouldn't be at the orifice of large vessels in the aorta. So you should know that anatomy also. Eh? The celiac trunk at this level, the superior mesenteric artery at this level, renal artery almost at the same level, a little bit lower, eh? the inferior mesenteric artery and the bifurcation of the aorta. Eh? These lines shouldn't, whoops, should go back. These lines shouldn't be in this position, at least the tip, either here at a high position or here at a low position. That's why you have to know this anatomy, the origins. And why do they have a silly course like this? You understand if you see a lateral film. Filled with contrast, this was a, uh, a study of a dead child. Uh, here they come from the umbilicus, then they go down in a downward direction. There they go. Uh, behind the anterior bowel wall, uh, not bowel wall, abdominal wall. Then they enter the pelvis. There it goes. And then eventually deep in the pelvis, they enter the internal iliac artery and then they enter the common iliac artery, and then they enter the aorta. So that's a quite strange way of going, but that's the way it is. That's normal anatomy of the umbilical artery. And you, know the, you need to know the location of the orifices of the great arteries. What's wrong here? 
Do, do you know, by the way, why in the previous image we had two arterial lines placed? That makes no sense. Eh? They, miss, they have mistaken one of the orifices for the, for the vein, and they thought they introduced a venous line and an arterial line. But they made two arterial lines. So what's wrong here? One, two. They inserted two umbilical vein lines. There they go, and there they go. Where does this one end? This is fetal anatomy. Because this is not caval vein, this is not caval vein, this is not caval vein. Here it enters the right atrium, and when it inserted up, where does it go to? Is it into the lung? Is it into the mediastinum? No. This is a normal, well, it's not, it shouldn't be there, but it's normal anatomy where it's positioned. No, no, actually, actually not. It's, it's not the duct. Hmm? Yes, it passed the foramen ovale, so it went from the, whoops, from the right atrium through the foramen ovale to the left atrium, which is the natural course of fetal blood. Yeah? It bypasses the right side. It immediately goes to the left side by the oval foramen. Then it's in the left atrium, and when it's in the left atrium and it goes up like this, it must be in the, yes, the upper left pulmonary vein. Yeah? And it shouldn't be there. It should be withdrawn until this position. It should be at the level of the diaphragm. That's the most safe way. You don't want the tip to be within the right atrium because these tips are so small eh, they can make small tears into the wall of the right atrium and cause a uh, and cause blood in, uh, and tamponade uh, blood in the pericardium. Well how does the umbilical vein uh, runs? It runs like this. Uh, this is the umbilicus then it runs just behind the abdominal wall in a quite a ventral position. We will see the lateral image in a moment. Then it passes through the liver. It goes through the liver. And we can divide the part in the liver in three parts. This part, which is just called the umbilical vein in the liver. Then this part. This is a part of the left portal vein. So the umbilical vein uses the portal system for a short moment. Eh? Call it vessel sharing. And then it enters through the ductus venosus into the right atrium. And the ductus venosus is more or less comparable. You can see it as the fourth liver vein, eh? which enters the right atrium. It will disappear completely after birth, at least from an imaging point of view. We can't see it anymore. So let's say we all know the portal vein. And the left portal vein, this is the main portal vein. This is the right portal vein, which we don't see. This is the left portal vein. And the left portal vein makes a very silly, almost 90 degree corner, which is quite unnatural. And that is because it's an, yeah, more or less embryonic remnant. This part of the portal vein, which we can see in everybody, has been a part of the umbilical vein, which is the umbilical recess of the portal vein. Next time you image an adult, eh, just look at that silly part of the left portal vein. It's a part of the umbilical vein. So let's have a look at the anatomy. This is how the umbilical vein runs. Now this is, this is the umbilical vein. There it goes. This is the portal system. This is the porta itself, the right portal vein, the left portal vein, the umbilical recess of the portal vein, this, and then the left portal vein again. This is the way the anatomy goes, and this is the lateral film. You can understand. This is the umbilical vein. There it passes through the liver. Here it passes through the portal vein and here it goes to the right atrium. So yes, an umbilical vein can cause a portal thrombosis, and yes, often it does.
usually the whole left portal vein is, uh, is closed by that. So this is the normal anatomy. So where is this one? It runs like this. There it goes. And it should have run like this. But it has chosen this way. It's in the left portal system. So it should be withdrawn. This is a wrong position. And if we perform a CT in a very young child, you can see the umbilical vein system. Here it goes. It's partially thrombized because it's filled with thrombotic material that usually happens soon after birth. It runs like this. And this is the ductus venosus, which goes to the right atrium. That's normal anatomy in a newborn. All right, let's forget, forget the umbilical lines. Let go to some, let's go to some variants of the stomach, because I should talk about the hollow viscera. This is more or less normal in a child, and these kind of investigations I perform routinely every week in children, mostly because of reflux. So pediatric radiologist sees a lot of contrast uh, images of the hollow viscera. Often it looks like this, with a very high position, as you can see, of the antrum of the stomach. Not here, but it, it seems to be a little bit upturned. What might be, uh, what might be the cause? It might make a misdiagnosis of something, which usually is not the case. If the antrum of the stomach is turned up and rotates even more and more and more, what happens? It's some kind of rotation disturbance of the stomach, and we have two types of those. Ever heard of an organoaxial volvulus of the stomach? When the stomach is twisted around its own axis, well, it starts with an upturn of the antrum of the stomach. And it looks like this. But in children, especially young children, it's quite normal to have an anatomy like that. And you don't have to be, to be afraid of pathology, especially uh, when the passage of contrast through the duodenum is good. So it looks like an organoaxial volvulus, but usually it isn't. So this is a normal high position of the antrum. What might this be? This child was having severe problems. And look at the head which there, and look at the nasogastric tube, which is going like this. It's going like this. It's going like this. Then this is the stomach. And this is the, this is the gastric outlet. So this is also some kind of rotation disturbance of the stomach. But this is the other type, which is more rare. Yes, this is a mesenteroaxial rotation. Mesenteroaxial volvulus of the stomach, usually facilitated by loose ligaments, by a hypermobility of the spleen, sometimes relaxation of the diaphragm, sometimes diaphragmatic hernia. And in this child, indeed, we see an eventuration of the diaphragm, probably facilitating this rotation disturbance. And you can even, although it's difficult, you can recognize it on ultrasound because you see a very silly projection. This is the fundus of the stomach. This is a sagittal image, the fundus of the stomach. Then it turns that direction. And this is the antrum. It's a ventral and more or less superior to the fundus, eh, which is a typical appearance of a of an mesenteroaxial volvulus of the stomach, which is a very serious disease and this, this child needed to be operated upon. So the antrum is ventral of the fundus. So let's move on to the duodenum. Uh, in pediatric radiology, it's quite important, and it should go like this. This is the D1 part. Let's call it the duodenal bulb. The D2 part, which is the descending part. And then the horizontal part, which is called the D three segment, and that's quite important in pediatric radiology, and this is the D, the duodenum four part, which is going 
to the location of the ligament of trites, and here it enters the peritoneal cavity, and here it becomes the jejunum. It should be like that. If you look at the duodenum during the, these kind of investigations, always look at the lateral view, because the duodenum should be in a retroperitoneal position. Now, the retroperitoneum isn't my topic today, eh, but it is there, and this is a lateral view. The duodenum should go in a caudal, in a dorsal direction. That is normal. Eh, and if the ligament of trites is on the left side of the midline, more or less at the level of the pyloric channel, it's in a dorsal position, eh, then we know there's no malrotation. There's no malrotation of the gut. And that's important for child for pediatric radiology. Because a malrotation of the gut, which doesn't need to give any problems, perhaps one of you also has a malrotation of the midgut. But what's the major complication of a malrotation? Midgut volvulus. And that may be fatal within a few hours. So that's why it's important to diagnose malrotation, eh? uh, and children who have a malrotation will have surgery eh? to solve the problem, to prevent that, well, they, had, that they, they will have a midgut volvulus, which can appear later in life. So this is the normal anatomy. And there are some variants which might simulate malrotation and which are important to know. This is normal. Duodenum. And sometimes you can see extra folds here. And that can be normal. It's a normal passage, and there's a normal position of trites, eh, then there's no problem at all. You may accept a few folds, especially in the D2 part, like in this patient, like in this patient. Then it goes up. And like in this patient, it's even more weird. We don't know exactly how that happens. Perhaps it's, uh, it's the common bile duct which is causing uh, this extra wrinkle over there. Perhaps it's a minor form of uh, pancreas annulare with a little fibrous bands. We don't know because this is a real annular pancreas. And that's not normal. And these children do have problems of passage of food. And we know from the lecture from Peter how it looks like and how it originates. There it is. But perhaps these extra folds are caused by some minor form of congenital abnormalities of the pancreas without any other complaints. At least they are there, and they shouldn't be, uh, in, they shouldn't be made the interpretation of a malrotation uh, with these extra folds. Uh, perhaps one other tip. I'm not talking about pathology, so I'm not talking about pyloric hypertrophy, uh, but I would like to mention, talking about normal anatomy, if you're looking for the pyloric channel in children and you can't find it, try to find the gallbladder. That's easy, because the pyloric channel and the duodenal bulb and the gallbladder are always next to each other. So once you have found the gallbladder, you know the structure which is lying against it at the medial side, that must be the pyloric channel or the duodenal bulb. And that can be very handy in making, uh, uh, in identifying the anatomy. So this is a CT for another congenital abnormality in a patient, uh, which might be important for the surgeon. Usually it's accompanied by other congenital anomalies, but something is wrong. This is normal embryologic anatomy. And something here is wrong. This is a part of the antrum of the stomach. This is a small part of the duodenum. This is the pancreas. What's wrong? This is the portal vein. Because have you ever realized what's the location of the portal vein towards the duodenum? Is that the ventral side of it, or is that the dorsal side of it? Ever heard of this, pre duodenal portal vein? It's a known abnormality which is important for the surgeon because he doesn't want to put his knife in there because it's a vein and when it bleeds, etc. He has to anticipate on it. So this is a 
variant, but it's usually accompanied by other pathology. But yes, it exists, and you really have to look for it in a very conscious way, otherwise uh, you can overlook it. Let's go from a normal duodenum to this. What's happening here? Easy question. Perhaps a difficult answer. Yes, this is a malrotation. I see a lot of jejunal loops on the right side of the spine. I don't see trites here, so this looks as if it's a malrotation. And yes, it is. And these patients need surgery, even if they don't have complaints, because they may develop, uh, uh, they may develop a uh, midgut volvulus. And why? Because these patients have a very small mesenteric root. Usually we have a mesenteric root which runs from trites to the right lower pole of the cecum, which is a quite a broad band on which the, the bowel loops are attached, like this. If it's very small, if it's a small pedicle, and patients with a malrotation do have a very small pedicle, it's very easy for the bowel loops to twist. And it's a matter of chance if it happens in the first year, the second year, or when you're 60. <laughs> Do you know the, 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 the famous pop group, the BGs? One of those members died from a midgut volvulus uh, because he had a malrotation and he didn't realize it his whole life. And it happened when he was 55 or 60. So yes, it can happen. This is malrotation. And here we see, this is the late phase of this examination. This is the terminal ileum, and this is the cecum. So it's over here. I think trites must be somewhere here. So from here to here, somewhere is the mesenteric attachment. Very narrow because the cecum pole and trites are approaching each other. So the pedicle will be very small. Mel rotation and normal. There's another way to find out uh, if somebody has a malrotation or could have a malrotation, uh, we don't have to proceed immediately to, uh, to this, these kind of investigations. Uh, one of the ways is to think about a malrotation is to look at the, the, the position of the superior mesenteric vein towards the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, is this a normal relation? Now, the way I remember it, the vein should always be on the right side. Why? The superior mesenteric vein knows he has to go to the portal vein, and the portal vein is on the right side because he has to go to the liver, which is on the right side. Uh, so he's anticipating on that. And if it's on the left side, it's not 100% proof of malrotation. It's a suggestion of malrotation. Sensitivity about 60 to 70%. That's not that high. So, but it's an indication of malrotation. In children with abdominal pain, I always look at the position of this. And especially when I go down and I see them twisting around each other, and again, I will not show pathology, perhaps in my workshop on Friday, I will show a midgut volvulus. Then you see it swirling around each other, and that's definite proof of a, uh, of a, of a volvulus. Uh, this is suggestive of a malrotation. Another sonographic sign, which seems to be much more sound to exclude or to prove a malrotation is another sign. This is normal. This is the artery. This is the vein. This is the aorta. This is the caval vein. What might this be? Passing between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. This is normal anatomy. That's the duodenum. And if we see this anatomy, and in children it's quite easy to define this anatomy, at least you know that most of the rotation in the embryonic period has been fulfilled. And we need more papers on this subject, but this has a much higher sensitivity and specificity than only looking at this. So nowadays in children with abdominal pain, I look at this relation and I try to find the duodenum. And when it's passing, I say, well, f at this moment, at least I don't think of a malrotation, and this, this, this child is not prone for a volvulus. So use all your sonographic signs. 
And when in doubt, you always can proceed to contrast images. And another thing perhaps interesting to know is that patients with a mal rotation have a higher chance of having internal herniation. So if you perform a small bowel follow through, look at all moments at the bowel loops, but because in this patient who has his internal herniation here, and he had complaints of that. He had complaints of his internal herniation. He didn't have problems with his malrotation or his lats bands. He didn't have a midguid volvulus. He had an internal herniation. Because in those kind of patients, there are often defects in the mesentery through which bowel loops can slip and get stuck a little bit, then release again. So you have a very variable pattern of complaints. But yes, realize it exists in children with malrotation. Let's go to the small bowel loops. And if we go to the small bowel loops and we have, we're talking about normal varines, I think one of you also has a Meckel's diverticulum. It may be asymptomatic and it may not be. In those patients who have symptoms, it's usually because of gastric content, gastric mucosa in the Meckel's diverticulum. You also can, so, can find a pancreatic tissue and that Pathological tissue can cause ulceration. Ulceration can cause bleeding. And the most common complaint of patients with the Meckel's diverticulum is, of course, uh, uh, rectal bleeding, uh, uh, red rectal bleeding. It's fresh blood. It is a part of the, it's a remnant of the omphaloenteric duct. Uh, uh, when we were fetuses, we all had a connection in very early life uh, between the umbilicus and the bowel loops. Uh, and that whole omphaloenteric duct may persist, and I will show an example soon, but if it, it partly regresses and only this part remains about 30 centimeters from the ilium, the terminal ilium, uh, uh, then it's called a Meckel's diverticulum. It's very difficult to make the diagnosis. This is a giant Meckel's diverticulum with contrast studies. Uh, we need a Meckel scan, nuclear medicine, and this vague image is enough for the surgeon to decide to perform surgery. But we can also have a shot with ultrasonography. Sometimes it's difficult, but sometimes it's easy, especially when it's inflamed a little bit. You see a blind ending loop, which is not the appendix. We will have a look. In this patient, this is the bowel loop the Meckel is extending. This is the Meckel's diverticulum. And if you go down, it will end blindly. It takes some experience, but it's fun. And there it's gone. It's a blind ending loop, and I had to try it over and over again. And after 20 times, I thought, well, this must be a blind ending loop. I looked one day later, and then we could even see an inversion of the this was a loop now filled with fluid. So also this was a giant Meckel's diverticulum. diverticulum. And here we see, can, we see inversion of the diverticulum in itself, more or less a little intersusception, which makes the detection even easier. So yes, in some cases, you can visualize a Meckel's diverticulum with ultrasound. This is how the bastards look like. And here we see a patient who has a patent omphaloenteric duct. So this is more or less a Meckel's diverticulum, which is extending to the umbilicus, and it loses contrast through the umbilicus. Usually in former days when these patients could not be operated upon, for instance in the Middle Ages, you, you could find these people on the fancy fresh because they could poo through their belly button, and that was some kind of weird attraction. So nowadays, of course, they will have surgery. Let's go to some other. Let's call it a normal variant of the small bowel. If you perform bowel ultrasonography, even in adults, you will find this. And this, of course, is an intersusception. It's a small one, but it's a definite intersusception. We can see some mesenteric fat, which is caught in the intersusception. No lymph nodes are present, but what is the most striking feature of this intersusception, you can see the peristalsis is going on. 
it's just normally going on. And that's definite proof of something we call a benign small bowel intersusception, and it has no clinical consequences. These are intersusceptions with a small diameter, a small length. The normal ileocecal intersusception has a diameter of 2.5 on the average, and no peristalsis. And yes, it has lymph nodes inside. This one has a thin out rim, no lymph nodes, persisting peristalsis, often incidental, often more. And you can see it frequent in celiac diseases, but also in other bowel diseases, which have slight, which have slight thickening of the wall and hyperperistalsis. So these are benign small bowel intersusception. Let's finish the lecture of today with the appendix. This is the appendix we all know in children, in adults. It has a mean length of 8 to 10 centimeters, a mean thickness of 4 millimeters. It has, and we'll talk about that later, it has gut signature. It is a bowel loop with mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and lymphoid tissue, and it even has its own mesentery, which can be visualized, especially when it's inflamed or when there's some fluid around it. Of course, it's in the right lower quadrant. Yeah, we know McBurney's point. There are some variations. It can be in the left upper abdomen when there's a malrotation. It can be in the inguinal canal, and then you have an amiar, amia uh, herniation. And in 5%, it can be retrocecal, and it has its own meso. Well, there it is. It has a lot of variations, as you can see. This is the McBurney point as we know it now, one-third of a line, the outer one-third of a line between the umbilicus and the superior anterior uh, iliac spine. Although McBurney itself described it in another way, he said it's 1.5 to 2 inch from the spine. So we slightly changed his original description nowadays, and he didn't like it. So an important problem is the retrocecal appendix, because it's difficult to visualize unless we use certain tricks. First, let's have a look how the appendix looks like. This is gut signature. You will find it in any part of the digestive tract. You will find it in the esophagus, you will find it in the stomach, you will find it, etc., etc. This is the stomach, which shows that anatomy most nice. And these are al alternating layers of white and black. For instance, the white part, sometimes called the superficial mucosa, which is some saliva, but most of all is just the interface between those bo both black layers. So let's call this the superficial mucosa. Then this blackish layer is the mucosa itself. Then the white layer is the submucosa. Then the black layer is the muscular layer. And the outer rim is again the serosa. And almost all organs of the intestinal tract, uh, the, the hollow viscous, viscous have, these, have this anatomy. And also the appendix. This is the appendix with the same layers. This is the lumen. This is the mucosa. It's rather thick. This is the submucosa. And this is the muscular layer. As we can see, and of course, this is the serosa. The same we see here. This is the superficial mucosa, or the interface of the lumen. This is the mucosa itself. This is the submucosa, and this is the muscular layer. And what's the difference? Because this is also rather small in size. What's an important difference between the ilium and the appendix? That the appendix, no, let's go back. The appendix doesn't show inner folds on these slices. Here we have folds of the mucosa, and the appendix doesn't. And why is the mucosa so thick in the appendix? Because this is the mucosa, and this is the mucosa. This is because of the lymphoid tissue. There's a lot of lymphoid tissue in the appendix, which is shown in a physiological thickening of the mucosa in the appendix compared to other 
bowel loops. So what are the criteria for a normal appendix? An inner hypo, 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 hypoechoic band, which is a mucosa without folding, diameter of less than six to seven millimeters. It's compressible. Sometimes there's some air in it, sometimes some stools. Sometimes you can even see some peristalsis in it. Why not? It's a tubular organ. Yeah. Just wait and see. Yeah. There's normal mesenterial fat surrounding it, and it has a moderate vascularity. Yeah. That's a normal appendix. But don't rely too much on the diameter, especially in children. This one is five. This is an appendix, and a few minutes later, when watching it, some fluid inside, it changes into this. It has a contraction. And a few minutes later, it changes again to this. So also, the appendix might contract. And during a period of contraction, he might be a little bit thicker than normal, of course, I would say. So in this case, the inner band has some folding but it still is the appendix and not the terminal ileum. In this case, the appendix is actually too thick, but the child didn't have any complaints. There's no hyperemia. And this child just has lymphoid hyperplasia. And this child had, had a mild form of immune deficiency disease. So this is not a severely inflamed appendix. So occasionally the diameter is more than six. In this case, it was seven, filled with content. Also the patient had no complaint and this was just uh, temporarily luminal content. And this one was nine centimeter in a patient with no problem and this is a well-known category of patients. This was a patient with cystic fibrosis. Patients with cystic fibrosis have bowel wall thickening. They might have a large appendix, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it is inflamed. So always also look at other parameters and also look at the clinical picture of the patient. This was a coincidental finding in a patient who didn't have any pain at that moment. Look at the appendix. It's huge. Well, it's huge. It's almost one centimeter. And I'll show it again, because something is silly about this appendix. You can see it to a good advantage. But this is not abdominal wall. You, you have a very nice view of the whole appendix, but I'm looking from the back. This was a retrocecal appendix, and if you cannot find the appendix, put your transducer on the lateral side, and even at the back side, because when it's retrocecal, eh, then you can find it. Eh. Use your imagination and know in 5% of the cases, the appendix might hide. And this is probably also a child with some kind of immune deficiency disease with lymphoid hyperplasia or hypertrophia. So I think our journey ends now. So any question, this was a wake up call. So if there are no questions, yeah. What kind of did this man? <laughs> well, I think he went to an emergency department, <laughs> and hopefully his spleen uh, survived. No, if there are no questions, I wish you a very pleasant uh, Esgar. Uh, I will have another meeting and another lecture on the Friday morning, which will be about uh, emergencies, pediatric emergencies. So you're more than welcome to visit that lecture. Thank you for your attention.